Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. This episode is brought to you by Element Electrolytes. We know that salt, potassium, and magnesium are essential minerals, especially for those on carnivore, keto, and low-carb diets to relieve hunger, dizziness, cramps, headaches, and keep so many of your bodily processes running optimally, including sleep, brain and mental health, hormonal health, your heart, immunity, and more. Element Electrolytes are convenient, evidence-based, and delicious. My wife and I have been using Element for years, every single day. They're great for fueling hard workouts, getting adapted and beating keto flu, fasting, traveling with them, and kickstarting your day with energy. They're used by Navy SEALs, Olympic weightlifters, jujitsu athletes, and everyday people who want to make themselves better, like you and me. They're also founded by superhero Rob Wolf. (laughs) Element is offering free, that's right, free people, Element sample packs to Carnivore Cast listeners. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Go to drinklmnt.com slash carnivorecast to claim this awesome deal. That's drink lmnt.com forward slash carnivore cast, one word, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Batista Locatelli is returning to the carnivore cast for part two. Last time we covered his incredible, almost unbelievable story of losing over a hundred pounds, beating his meth and heroin addictions and turning his life around. Um, he's the operations manager for seven sober living homes in Southern Utah, over 176 residents in early recovery. He's actually lost hundred pounds over 10 times before finding a way to maintain it. Um, and if you haven't checked out my first episode with Batista, please, please go listen to that now. Stop recording this recording. Um, cause it was so unbelievable. Um, but we're lucky enough to have Batista back on today. Welcome to the show, Batista. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. So Batista is at Joyful Carnivore on Instagram. I forgot to mention that, um, but definitely check out his page as well. He shares a lot of great and cool and interesting content um, when he's not being banned. (laughs) But um, why don't we um, get a little bit more into, we talked about your life story a lot, but why don't we talk a little bit more about finding carnivore? How how did that happen for you? Yeah. So, um, so, you know, just kind of struggling with weight, the majority of my life and uh, not really having the healthiest relationship with food. I think, um, you know, the addictions um, in general, like I covered in the last um, episode was just kind of thriving in my life. And it always seemed like I was either passing the baton from either drugs and alcohol to food addiction, or I was passing the baton to other addictions that were surfacing in my life, you know? And it seems to be that whenever you um, tend to start to work on one thing, as far as, you know, me going in, like right now in school, in graduate level, they talk about the disease model, you know, they obviously cover, you know, cancer and heart disease and diabetes and things like this, but they use the exact same disease model for addiction. And so sometimes when we're working on one addiction and maybe it's the, the most, um, uh, loud addiction at the time, at the time, you know, for me, it was drugs and alcohol. So that seemed to be the most paramount addiction that I had to address. But when you have an addictive personality, um, those addictions will surface in other areas of your life that you didn't even know you had areas in. And so, um, so basically that obsession, that compulsion can kind of come to the surface in, in, uh, food and sugar and in dieting in, um, um, it can come in shopping. I mean, I don't know if you've ever 
you know, been on somebody's uh, cha- or page or they've gone to their YouTube channel and they make this recipe and it seems amazing. Of course, like in their information below, they link you to their Amazon page where you can buy specifically that ingredient that you need or that that, you know, protein sparing mold or whatever. And before you know it, you know, now you're on a, you're starting to rack up the credit card bill. And so um, the addiction model can, and is like a disease model and it can surface in other areas of your life. When it comes to nutrition, um, I was always struggling with balance. There was absolutely, I mean, I've kind of struggled with balance for the majority of my life and just knowing when too much is too much or when maybe I was, um, in fact, you know, punishing myself in a strange way. Um, I wouldn't say 100% eating disorder, but there was like this mentality where if I consumed less and less being, um, you know, kind of a broad term, meaning that I would go anywhere from, 1500 calories to down to 500 calories. And so the struggle is real. I mean, you could say that um, when I was in my drug and alcohol addiction, I would go to any lengths to get my next fix because the obsession and compulsion is so loud that you will do anything, even if it's irrational and it doesn't make any type of sense to the normal person to keep that alive. You, you really will go to any lengths and, and to the point where, unfortunately, it overrides, uh, excuse me, it overrides that wise mind to where um, you end up doing things that you would never do and you're in places that you'd never be. And so, um, you, you know, when it comes to nutrition, like I would, I would do anything. If you told me eat 100 calories a day, I could do it. If you told me eat, you know, all fat, like eat all the fat in the world and no protein. And I would probably do it. You know, if you told me that if you eat 10 hundred, you know, <laughs> some fast bars and drink a shake and a sensible meal, then, um, you know, <laughs> I would, I, I would probably do it. You know, I'm going to mimic, I'm going to imitate, I'm going to, you know, seek out your results. And, um, you know, it's something, it's another kind of uh, quasi addiction of mine that I've found myself having to refrain from, um, since I've gotten into this space is just to allow myself to be. And that's um, a really hard thing for me to wrap my brain around. So um, even when I get to goal weights, I'm, I look around and I'm like, don't, shouldn't I be achieving something? Like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I, like I need, what's my next goal? What's my next mark? And uh, you and I were briefly talking about this um, before we came on to uh, to the recording. But you know, when I when I achieve something, I don't necessarily stay in that space for long. And um, I don't know if it's fear of success or you know, um, also maybe fear of sabotaging. That if I you know get to in my head about it or my ego kicks in, then I will falter. But I have been in that space many times, like you said in the introduction, 10 times I've lost 100 pounds. So the journey to carnivore um, hasn't been paved easily. Um, I'm very, very, very happy that I made it to this space, though. And it is because of people like you that have shown their, their, I, like I said at the very end of our last recording, you know, when you showed how you travel and eat carnivore, I was like, okay, like that's doable. I can do that, <laughs> you know. And and you might not even be thinking that many people were watching that, but like, I mean, I actually owned that for a minute because I travel back and forth to work to a different city at least once or twice a week. And it's about an hour and a half away. So anyways, long story short. um, uh, So yeah, you know, there was Atkins, um, which, uh, you know, when I was younger was really, really, really famous. And then there was the new revolution of Atkins. Atkins came out with this new revised book. Um, you know, when I was in my like, uh, late twenties, early thirties, I'm 44. And then, um, there was, uh, you know, um, I tried to mimic that a bunch of times. Um, like I said, in the, the previous podcast, I did HCG, which is a restriction of 500 calories a day. You do inject, um, a hormone that mimics your body being pregnant. So when you are actually at 500 calories uh, a day eating it's 3.5 ounces of protein coupled with yeah 
coupled with um, a cup of uh, vegetable, like usually cucumber, um, what was it? Cucumber. Uh, and then uh, you could have cauliflower. And then the other thing was you could have a half a, or a small, one small apple and a half a grapefruit a day. And it's this whole thing that was initially started similar to like how keto and carnivore was started to like help out with people that were um, medically sick as far as not diabetes, but they were having seizures and whatnot. Um, the Dr. Simeon was doing this back in the seventies for a similar thing. It really wasn't for weight loss. And they had found out in controlled studies that weight loss was achievable, obviously through eating 500 calories a day. Um, but the, the purpose of it was to kind of control, um, these outbursts, um, of people like being triggered to have seizures and whatnot. So Dr. Simeon created this HCG and, uh, they found out that if they gave the human that was on the diet, um, the hormone that they would lose up to a pound to two pounds a day, men, usually one to two pounds, women, usually, uh, anywhere from a half pound to a pound a day. So that's remarkable. And then they reverse you. It's kind of like this crazy cut and they reverse you back out of that to a normal calorie maintenance, like from 500, they reverse you back out to like for a man, like anywhere from 22 to 2,400, 2,600, whatever your body can hold. And so, um, yeah. And I metabolically, you know, did some damage there. had no idea. I thought by coming out of the reverse that, um, on that specific one, that, Um, I was going to be like, okay, you know, metabolically. Okay. But, you know, because I had been kind of dibbling and dabbling in every single diet fad you can imagine, including slim fast, the Jenny Craig, um, weight watchers, uh, Atkins, South beach diet. Um, you know, you name it. Um, I have done it, uh, you know, and if it came in a bottle or if it was, if you ate this magic pill, Fen Fen, um, yeah, back, back when Fen Fen was an, an huge, uh, the list just goes on and on and on because, uh, you know, I had to fix that, this exterior thing, which was my weight. Um, it had nothing to do with the emotional connection as to why I was eating these copious amounts of food to fix a feeling, you know, had I known back then that like therapeutically I could have gone and got a, you know, some type of clinical team to assist me to walk through some of these emotions, maybe I could have then addressed why I was turning to this coping mechanism, which was food. So the weight goes up a hundred, down a hundred, up a hundred, down a hundred. So finally keto, um, you know, when I got out of treatment this last time, I, I started, you know, just the keto word was really, really, really buzzed. I mean, and like I, Robert Sykes, Keto Savage, um, there was Obese to Obese, there was a Keto Connect, there was a lot of people on YouTube that were making it kind of bigger and bigger, and they were having great success with it. And uh, so I got into the keto space for about like three years, three, maybe three and a half years. And, uh, you know, I, I played around so many different angles on keto. In the beginning, um, I was all about fat bombs and it it didn't dawn on me until, you know, well into keto, probably two years that I was like mimicking the standard American diet in the keto space. It was as though I was trying to eat exactly what I eat pre-keto, but I was doing every single thing I did low carb. So, um, or, you know, low, lower sugar. and. It, and then it dawned on me, like, wait a minute, like, there's something broken here. Like, I'm trying to live the way I used to live um, and trying to somehow get into the state of ketosis, which I'm going to then, you know, kick into fat burning mode, which is what everyone was preaching about. And, um, but all my plates, all my meals, everything that I'm cooking is somehow mimicking the glorious standard American diet. Um, and it was kind of the, you know, the, the worship of the mug cake and, you know, the, all the desserts and the keto and, and there was something in my mind that shifted and it was like, maybe, maybe I am kind of having an issue, uh, with being slightly, 
you know, because who isn't? Who doesn't love, love all the sweets and, and all the greatness and, and creating, you know, biscuits and gravy on a cold day with almond flour and cook? Like, who wouldn't want to have a little bit lower of a glycemic impact and still be able to feel as though you're not being, um, you know, like in this box and you're being punished, so to speak? And tons of people were having significant weight loss while allegedly, I mean, I don't know what happened behind closed doors, but supposedly they were losing tons of weight. They might've been very well posting as though they were living this way and creating all these recipes. And I'll talk about that in a second because I have some inf- interesting information on that because I've done some investigation with people on Instagram and they finally have come clean with me. <laughs> I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but uh, it's quite interesting uh, how many people have food blogs and they don't eat a, a morsel of what they make. But um, anyways, so um, so basically, uh, yeah, I, you know, I had to like address, what am I doing? Like, why am I trying to mimic this? And, you know, it wasn't just one mug cake, right? I had to like hit up two. If I made a whole pan of fat bombs, I have a really bad, I've had a, I don't want to call it a problem. It's just, it's just something I do. So I'm not going to shame it. But in the middle of the evening, for some reason, I like to get up and I like to mob on food. It always two or three in the morning. I just, it's something I like to do. So I've tried to change it and shift it. And uh, I can talk about that in a second. But anyways, um, if I made a sheet of fat bombs, I need like more than one fat bomb, like three, four fat bombs. And so the, the whole reason of doing it was to have a little bit of extra fat in your diet. But here I was taking advantage of it because it was like a chocolate treat, right? So, um, Anyways, I basically then started YouTubing, um, watching um, Bella, and I just was watching her back when she was in New York City, and she was going uh, to Juilliard, and she was a student, and she was eating on a budget, and and she was pretty much maybe six months had a YouTube channel, and she was recording everything, like how she went to the bathroom, how her period changed how um, basically, you know, how she was feeling, all the butter she was eating, how she was coupling it with this, how she gained a little bit of weight, but she was feeling better. She was coming from a vegan diet. And I thought, you know, of course, my mind was like, I need to go next level, right? I can't just stay in this keto space. I need to go next level because I had plateaued um, for quite some time. And so, um, and a lot of people say they plateau for a week or two and they freak out. And, I, and I've been there personally, but, um, this was like a plateau of like three or four months. Thanks to buy optimizers for sponsoring the show. And I'm really excited to tell you guys about an excellent deal they're offering this November. This is the biggest blowout deal they will be offering all year. So if there's a time to stock up, it is now what they're offering is over $200 worth of free gifts and a huge discount all month long on their Magnesium Breakthrough product. Their Magnesium Breakthrough is a full-spectrum magnesium supplement that includes seven unique forms of magnesium for stress relief, better sleep, and mental health all in one bottle. They're offering all sorts of awesome free gifts and products worth over $200 with select purchases. All month long, they're offering 10% off using my unique code, and you can only get this exclusive deal through my link, special for you listeners. You won't find it on Amazon or even the Bioptimizer's website. Go to magnesiumbreakthrough.com slash carnivore and use code carnivore to get your discount and free gifts today. Thanks so much and have a great day. During that keto time when I was investigating Bella, um, Steak and Butter Gal, I, uh, I was doing... Uh, research, right? Like I would do a cheat day. Um, I was exercising every single day. I was probably doing 20 to 30 minutes of cardio. And well, I should say four to five times a week. And I was doing um, strength training for 20 minutes, nothing intense, nothing crazy, no bodybuilding happening, but I was uh, just getting in there and putting forth a good effort, getting a nice little sweat on, and then I get in my car and start my day. I felt a little bit oxygenated. I felt good, had some oxygen in the bloodstream. So, um, and, and doing the keto diet. So once a week, we have a, you know, in the sober community, depending on whatever community you have, we'd have a little get together of, for all of us who, quote unquote, were still standing in regards to, there were several 
probably almost 100 people that we had all started with in several treatment centers, and we were all in drug court together. And a lot of us weren't standing anymore, meaning that a lot of them had either gone back out, some of them had died from overdose, some of them had moved on or whatnot. But the majority of the initial original group that we all started together, I think there was like 76 of us in drug court, that first phase, um, were there was like maybe six of us that were still clean and sober. Um, and uh, we'd get together and we'd have a little you know, we would break bread and we'd go have dinner together and, and, um, we call it sober, sober dinner. Like it was our recovery dinner and it was a space for us not to talk about recovery, but just to talk about what was going on in our lives and, you know, talk crap or talk, talk pop culture or whatever. And, um, so, um, during that time I was kind of researching with like, okay, so how do I, okay, so I'm going to have a cheat day. Well, you know, and everyone gets so crazy with that word, but back then, whatever, I called it a cheat day. So, um, and I'd have whatever I wanted. And then, you know, that went on for a month and, and I would get right back on, you know, the clock would strike, strike 12 and I would turn back, you know, into a pumpkin, <laughs> back into a keto pumpkin. And, uh, you know, I'd get right back at it. Boom. Okay. So the next day I was eating, you know, under 20 carbs and, uh, and, uh, you know, and every week I was still losing my, my weight loss wasn't as epic, but the water weight and me getting right back into keto- ketosis was pretty quickly. Um, and so I kept doing that. Well, the days that we were kind of deviating from plan started getting crazier and crazier. So first it was just one meal. Then it turned into two meals, right? And that was kind of doable. And then it was me and my neighbor downstairs, bless her heart. We were get, She would be outside at five o'clock in the morning smoking a cigarette, but then she, I guess she would go back to bed. And I heard her open her door down there. And so it was five in the morning, right? I normally wasn't waking up till like seven or eight. So I called her and I said, are you awake? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I think Starbucks opens here in a minute. You want to go get a Frappuccino? And she's like, yeah, it's cheat day. Let's go do it. So now our cheat days were starting at like 5 a.m. You know, we would go get a, and it was kind of gluttonous. We would go get a, a frappuccino, like gazillion calories, all the sugar. And we get a big old donut. We heat up an apple fritter. We'd come home. And literally 30 minutes later, we'd have this huge crash. And we'd be like, let's go take a nap. Like we, like we literally would go take a 30 minute nap, get up and go out to go get pasta or whatever, you know, <laughs> we were desiring for that cheat day. So it was a research thing that I tried. And finally I was like, okay, this is getting out of hand. And then of course, you know, weight loss started stalling. Um, once again, I was at a crossroads where I had to start to kind of, you know, just take my own inventory why am I doing this? Why do I desire the cheat? Like, why is it so important? You know, I know that I want to feel as though I'm still part of society. I want to feel quote unquote normal. I want to be able to socially be able to go out and then be engaged with friends. And, and I also want to, I want to be like everyone else. Like I want to have all the carbs too, and still have that waistline, like Sally Sue over here. Like, can I do that and still maintain what I'm doing. And I probably could now the, um, you know, I was because of my addiction with drugs and alcohol, I have a very, very high tolerance for pain. So, um, yeah, when I was doing those two days, did I feel like absolute crap? Did my energy tank? Could I feel the literal sugar coursing through my veins? Was it like weird and strange? Did I have sweats at the end of the nights? Did I feel like I was having carbohydrate withdrawals like that I kind of have associated with heroin opiate withdrawals? Absolutely. Did I actually express it to anyone? Like as far as it being a problem? Hell no. Because every week I wanted that, you know, dopamine spike and I was really looking forward to it. And, and all week long, you know, it was like, um, you know, I was working my butt off at the gym and on the diet to be able to achieve that day. And, um, so, you know, I didn't tell anyone, like, you know, I was up till three o'clock in the morning, like sweating on the back of my neck, like my pillows (laughs) wet and, you know, yeah, didn't say a word about that because I was you know, looking forward. And so me and my sponsor from Narcotics Anonymous were actually 
I told her finally, I got honest with one person and she's like, yeah, that's, it's weird, huh? She's like, I mean, we can eventually look at doing the steps, the 12 steps around uh, food and, and that type of stuff. But it's kind of mimicking the same thing, like drinking like a gentleman. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, uh, he said, well, you know, like people in recovery will try to drink on the weekends. But then that drinking on the weekends doesn't really work, especially if they're a meth addict or a heroin addict. They, uh, you know, it's kind of getting the dragon awakened and they are ultimately going to want, you know, their original get down. And so they'll get there somehow, some way, but drinking is just basically going to be like, uh, you know, temporarily. So if you identify as, as somebody like myself, who is, um, you know, an addict or a real alcoholic, um, you know, that without a shadow of a doubt, you can't just drink on the weekends. You can't be a weekend warrior. Some people can have a drink and they can put it down and never touch it again for a month. Um, a real al- addict or alcoholic it just doesn't work that way. And so the same thing was kind of uh, surfacing with this whole cheat day thing. Anyways, so we get to um, me starting to take my own inventory and question like what I'm doing and, and how this is looking and, and looking a little bit deeper into the whole health, the whole health aspect of it. Of course, I came in to contact with the lion diet, Michaela and her father and, um, finding out about her arthritic like journey and, um, other people having lupus and, and now I didn't, I wasn't diagnosed with, I, I did have some mental health issues happening, um, but I didn't have, you know, I had some eczema. My dad, on the other hand, has psoriasis, but he's also pretty much a active alcoholic and, and does pain medicine. So there's some kind of causation to like why he has an outburst of psoriasis. But um, I have a little baby eczema on my hand, nothing crazy. You know, I'm fair skinned. I have kind of reddish blonde hair. So I have had like some skin, whatever, and um, mental health mainly, of course, addiction. Um, but I'm looking at carnivore like through this health, health lens of, you know, and hearing Michaela's story like, wow, okay, um, maybe if I do start eliminating some things, maybe, who knows? Who knows? I mean, of course, I'm super hungry for the weight loss aspect of it. And that's going to be my, my primary focus. But who knows, maybe there is a possibility that, you know, I start to feel better than I already do on ketosis, you know, and, or keto rather. And um, so I started, so my, my partner, Brandon, um, and I, I'll make this really short, but when I first met him, he had a couple of days clean off of methamphetamines. I had two years clean. I knew it wasn't a good match because, uh, uh, you know, he was brand new and I kind of had to get out of his way to get connected to a higher power so that he could ultimately get better. Um, But if I was in his path, he would probably put me in the place of his higher power or his connection to something spiritual. So he wouldn't have the opportunity to be relieved of the obsession and compulsion. Um, And so, uh, yeah, you know, me and him just clicked right in the beginning and uh, he came from a broken a really broken family. Unfortunately, both doctors, they were Mormon um, at 18 years old. He goes to Brigham Young University and he was Mormon. And uh, he goes out to Northern Salt Lake City and comes back for Christmas to Virginia, tells his parents, um, I'm gay. And they said, okay, well, you either um, are going to get electroshock therapy um, and get this zapped out of you, or we're going to... um, write you out of the, you know, the, you don't, you're not going to be a part of this fam. And so he didn't know how to really internalize that. Of course, all he wow. heard was I'm not enough. Yeah. And, um, he got back on the airplane, went back out to BYU and hasn't spoken to them since. And so, um, um, when I met him, he was homeless, uh, living on the streets of St. George. Uh, we met through a dating app, but, I was in such a genuine, authentic space. And I have been dealing with so many addicts and alcoholics at this time, two years in and had been running one of the seven sober living houses that I, I didn't see people for whatever the package was on the outside. I saw people for either their pain body that they were carrying around, or I saw people for their actual genuine self. 
like I, I can see through a lot of the fluff and a lot of the, the lip service and I can get right to the, the spirit of a person pretty quickly. And I think that's kind of a gift that it's going to serve me well in therapy. But um, so with him, I just, I just, you know, and he goes, Batista, I got back on the plane and, you know, we had a hotel room. The one thing that was really different about this is that at the time I was kind of cross addicting with sex and him and I weren't, you know, engaging in that at all. We were actually taking the time to get to know one another. We were swimming in the swimming pool. He was crying in front of me. And I was like, what? I don't even know you. You're crying. You know, um, I do have a really weird uh, magnetic thing where people are drawn to me and they tell me every single thing in their life in the first 10 minutes of meeting me. And it's pretty fantastic. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah. You know, I, I use it for... a you know, now my job and whatnot, because it's, it's a beautiful thing that people trust me that much. But with him, he was just divulging, divulging, divulging. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I just met you. And he's like, I am so attracted to the fact that you're in, you're in recovery and you're doing well. And so anyways, um, he uh, tells me he gets back on the airplane and he hasn't spoken to his parents since now he was 18 years old then. And uh, he's now 35. So I mean, wow, boom. You know, I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you have a lot of unresolved trauma. But, but you know what I mean? Like there's some stuff that whew, like you need recovery because, uh, you know, he was literally going to the library Wi-Fi to contact me on a Google phone number that he had, you know, so it was sad. Um, he had broken down shoes. He was living out of a backpack. And um, within a matter of six months, long story short, I got him up to Cedar City. He got into a homeless shelter. He got a job. He got on his feet. But he was getting clean and sober for me. He wasn't doing it for himself. About six months in, he relapses. Um, I basically say, you know, you know that this is a non-negotiable with me. I love you. But if you're going to continue to get high, I can't be with you. And so I said, you have two options. You can either go back to the homeless shelter and start over, or I have an inn at one of these recovery places where you can do residential. He goes, I'll take the residential. I said, okay, my mom will take care of your dog, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, he gets into recovery. Now he's been in two and a half years. Um, so Brandon, like me, when we, you get into recovery, you know, a lot of people aren't really concerned with the fact that you're gaining weight and you're kind of using food as a coping mechanism because you have put down the hardcore chemical so a lot of therapists and and clinicians are looking turning a blind eye because they're just like oh my god you're actually eating and sleeping this is a positive you know this is a is total opposite of what you're doing so um brandon gained 100 pounds and um i had like been maintaining my 100 pound loss but i i was kind of looking for the next level like you know am i gonna be able to get down to whatever my bmi says you know can i get down from my height down to 180 you know i i hover around 211 to 14 and my you know it is a, just a number scientifically made up but that seems to be my new set point where it loves staying but uh i was going to be like okay let me give it a whirl let me try at the time um brandon was up probably 87 pounds. We were in San Francisco. We went on a, a road trip. Or we took a trip out to San Francisco. And uh, so um, he was really, he, every picture, he's like, oh my God, I'm huge. I'm like, you're not that, you're fine. And he's like, when we get back, can I, can we do something? And that something was, you know, he's going to buy the food. I'm going to cook it. So if I've done the research on something, he he's okay with benefiting from it. And I said, well, I'm interested in starting this carnivore thing. Um, and he's like, okay, what is it? And I said, well, we eat all the meats as much as we want. He's like, really? And he's like, yeah. And he's like, bet. <laughs> he's like, bet. Here's my credit card. So, <laughs> so, you know, and I love to cook. It's, it's, it's my love language. And um, so he, um, he basically, we went to Costco and we dropped probably $700. And, you know, I had already the keto knowledge of, you know, make sure you look at the, the seasoning packets and if it's doused in this and doused in, make sure it doesn't have nitrates and blah, 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 blah. And so I was checking everything out, making sure it was just raw meat and it wasn't like, you know, you know, cause he didn't, he could have cared less. He, he just, he would have eaten whatever. 
But um, me, I go to, you know, this is kind of my life. This is also my happy place sometimes is, is knowing all this information, what's going in my body and whatnot. It's exciting to me. Um, and so I think that he, he does care. He just doesn't care as much as me. And so um, anyways, so yeah, we got $700 worth of meat, came home. I started, I started Keto Batista on Instagram. And, uh, and then I, I was talking to carnivore uh, yogi and also um, carnivore hippie at the time. Uh, uh, who's now primal Kumari, but she's like, why don't you, she's like, you're a happy guy. You're a really happy guy. And I was like, I know. And she's like, I don't know why you're so happy because you've been through a lot. <laughs> she's like, but you definitely, your glass is half full considering, you know, the shoes that you've walked in in your life. And I said, well, that, I've always been like that. I have always been like that. I don't believe in any religion, but I've always believed that there is some type of entity out there that's had my back that has kept me um, alive and and well through all these years. And I'm very grateful for whatever power that is out there that, you know, creates the heavens and the universes. Um, I don't worship that power or, you know, like in a building or I don't have to have a human being in order to get me in contact with it. But I do believe that there's something out there because, you know, as a kid, I, I always just felt an immense amount of faith for whatever that was out there was getting me through to the next day. And somehow like, I was pretty happy about, even though I didn't have much or, or I was suffering through a lot of um, predators and abuse and, and self-inflicted abuse um, somehow I, you know, like I was just a happy guy, you know, like I, my perspective was pretty, you know, maybe it was a state of survival too to get through it. It could have been a, a way for me to be in a state of denial to survive what was happening. But nonetheless, I, I always knew that the next day would come and that I would be fine and that things would be taken care of. And I wasn't going to worry what, how things were going to pan out or try to control a bunch of it. I just knew that um, that whatever was going to happen, I'd be taken care of. And, and sure enough, the next day would come and I had evidence, um, actual evidence and information that things were taken care of. And so, and then it was always, if I was doing the next right thing and I was doing well in my life and I was serving others, the things that were coming to me and the opportunities and the doors that were opening were bigger and brighter and, and, and more amazing. It was like, I was on an elevator and, and at the top floor, I, I, the door would open to the elevator and I'd be in the penthouse and I'd go further up in the hotel and further up in the, and the door would open and just more great things would open. And it was usually when I was helping more people out, but, Anyway, so um, me and Brandon get into carnivore. And uh, so I switched my handle to Joyful Carnivore. And I just wanted to be uh, crazy and fun on my Instagram feed and be colorful. I did want to represent LGBT. Um, I also wanted to really throw down the stigma that people have with homelessness, with addiction, with addicts, with, with alcoholism, with any type of uh, eating disorder, like with mental health, like I really wanted to highlight the fact and, and not necessarily normalize, but I wanted to um, create a space where people felt okay to be themselves. And, and also no matter what shape, size, whatever Christianity or whatever religious background they had that that I was going to be all accepting and all inclusive and all loving. And, uh, and that, and that hopefully they could find the space in their heart to be the same for, you know, the rest of humanity. And, and so me and me and Brandon just kind of went crazy on the carnivore and, you know, I ate all of the meats and, um, I had no, I wasn't looking at data. I wasn't looking at oxalates or, uh, uh, the actual elimination. I just was going kind of mimicking so to speak, what um, what uh, steak and butter gal Bella was doing, and I was eating all the meats and all the fats, and so Brandon, uh, you know, coming straight from a standard American diet, you know, where he was at the time he was assistant manager at Arby's, so he had he was making really good money, and um, uh, it's, it's really shocking, Scott, how good of money fast food makes <laughs> when you get into upper management. I was shocked, but anyways, uh, yeah. So he's, you know, he gets all the free food and, you know, he can make whatever 
you know, sandwich he wants there. And, and, and he liked cheese puffs and he could eat, drink a gallon of, of, you know, uh, regular vitamin D milk, full fat a day. And he would eat Taco Bell and sub like just all the crap, which I loved too at the time, you know, when I was not any of this, when I'm at my worst. And, um, but now I'm coming from a keto space and, and partially from the HCG and the, the caloric deficit. And so he's dropping like crazy amount, like three, sometimes five pounds a week. And I am like slowly going in the other direction. And so, um, then I started doing some research, um, cause I'm like, wow, he's really benefiting from it. And of course, you know, I, you know, I'm not gonna lie. I was like a little resentful, you know, I was like, what the heck? We're eating the exact same thing. And, um, you know, it's not his fault, but it was like, I was once again, questioning myself, like, what's, what's wrong with my, what's, what's, why is there something broken in me? And like, and, um, as I get further and further into, um, the research, you know, there was a lot of the things like levers and amounts and things. I was still kind of, I was under eating, you know, surprisingly, I thought I was actually eating a lot. Um, I was definitely satiated. He was satiated. Um, we were eating two large meals a day. Uh, you know, I always had to have some type of, uh, you know, dessert ish thing in there, whether it be Greek yogurt with some beef, you know, uh, protein powder mixed in with the Greek yogurt, full fat, or some type of, you know, end of the night cap thing that I had to like reward myself with. But so I started eliminating stuff like that out and, uh, I started seeing changes and whatnot. Meta- metabolically, I think that I am still a little bit damaged, not as bad as I was. Um, I got really irritated uh, because I came to the carnivore space for weight loss, but I was getting all these other beautiful, beautiful things happening to me. So Brandon's getting all those things, but I don't think he was so um, uh, cognitively aware of, you know, the Zen and, and all that stuff. He's just like, yeah, he's very simple, you know, like we're, and it's not that I'm complicated. It's just, I'm digging in deeper as to like, how is this benefiting me? And he's just achieving the most on the weight loss. So there's huge dopamine spikes from that. So he's, he's sold on the whole carnivore thing. He doesn't need to learn more. Whereas I was like, wait a minute, like, I am in charge of 176 residents in sober living. And on the regular, I get phone calls that are quite heavy and quite overwhelming. And the subject matter is a lot. And you're speaking like somewhere upwards of, you know, anywhere from 20 to 50 times a day. I'm either talking to a probation officer. I'm talking to a mother or father who's disgusted with their kid. I'm talking to a brother or a wife who doesn't know what to do with the drunk husband. I'm talking to a lot of, so I'm processing a lot. Then I go to work and I'm therapeutically helping out clients who are looking at me with every, you know, every, every little ounce of their spirit, like, help me, help me, please. Like you did it. I need like, show me the way. And I'm like, okay, it's going to take a lot of work, you know, but we can do it together and I'll hold your hand. And so, um, anyways, uh, so it's just, it can, you know, when you look at from the outside perspective into my life, I'm, I have my hands in a lot of different kitchens and I'm helping a lot of people and I have to take care of myself. But, uh, um, I was looking further into, wow, considering the fact that I'm full-time graduate student, I am in charge of seven sober living homes. Um, I also have a full-time job where I actually am an intern therapist and I actually have clients. Um, I'm diagnosing. Um, I'm responsible for their welfare in drug court. Uh, I have sit down like one-on-one actual private meetings with them and they're divulging stuff to me that's quite personal and, and very deep. And, uh, you know, and it takes time. You can't just talk about that kind of stuff and rush them out the door because you're hungry or because you got to go to the next thing. You have to give them that undivided attention. And so, through navigating through all that type of emotional um, work, you know, which kind of comes naturally to me, I was noticing though that I would normally mm, every so couple days kind of have a quasi meltdown 
with Brandon where I would unload all my feelings and he was super supportive and, and knows like pretty much how to get me out of that rabbit hole. And, uh, you know, it just reminds me of, of all the beautiful work that I'm doing, but all, less and less and less that was happening. Um, as I, when I was on carnivore, as I, um, started recognizing too, I was in this huge, uh, workman's comp case where they were taking all my mental health, psychiatric evaluations and diagnoses. And they were trying to basically build a case with this whole workman's comp thing. And it included some benefits and yada, yada, yada. So, um, my lawyers, you know, getting together with my clinical team, you know, as a therapist, it's always intelligent to also have a therapist so that you have somebody to talk to. And so I had a therapist, I had a counselor and I had a psychiatrist and they're a three person team. And, and basically they, uh, help me still to this day. I see my, my therapist weekly, but I see my psychiatrist like once every three months. Now it's actually going to be pushed out more because I'm on carnivore. I'll get to that in a second, but so I've been diagnosed with PTSD from the, um, you know, molestation as a child. And, uh, so, and I, and from the being physically, um, abused, you know, I have anxiety disorder and panic disorder. So when people kind of get in my bubble, I, I am, I have a panic attack and I can't breathe. If I'm in a grocery store and there's like too many carts and I don't see a way out of the aisle, I start to have panic. My face gets red. I feel like the oxygen is starting to close off and, and I can't breathe. Um, and so the first thought is to, uh, you know, fight or flight. So usually, cause I'm now in recovery, I don't fight, but I want to run. I want to be able to somehow get away from the impending doom that is coming in. And it's usually closing in. Of course, the aisle feels like it's starting to close in, which then makes the oxygen even more feel as though it's being closed off. Um, and there's just this, you know, like, you look upwards. Can I climb the, these aisles? Can I get up these shelves and get over to the other side and get away from these people that are coming in towards me like that? And so touch, um, you know, hugging, all that stuff, you know, was, uh, it's been a process. I'm totally beyond that. But uh, especially with people that I don't know in situations that are hyper um, tense in regards to there's a lot going on, people talking, uh, loud noises and whatnot. Um, it doesn't necessarily re-traumatize me, but it brings me to a state of panic and fear where uh, I'm just like, you know, what do I do? Where do I go? How do I get out of this? You know, and I've had to call a lot of people and say, that totally wasn't you. I apologize. I know that probably looked really weird and strange. And uh, I wasn't trying to be passive aggressive. It wasn't anything that you said that made me bolt. Um, but I like in order to survive another minute, I had to leave immediately and I had to leave fast. And uh, so, you know, anyways, now I'm on carnivore. And so those, those feelings, those emotions, those panic attacks, those, that anxiety is starting to lessen and lessen and lessen. And the, the PTSD, like the re -traum the, the trauma, like being re-triggered by me watching a movie on Netflix and somebody being abused in the movie. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm going, or me watching intervention, you know, on A&E and seeing this gal shoot up. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't like somehow all of a sudden it was like, I could actually watch stuff like that. And for some reason I wasn't freaking out. It was really weird. So I started like noticing, wow, what's going on here? Like, started talking to my psychiatrist who prescribes the medicine, uh, the therapist and the, you know, deals with the emotions and, and the healing. And so talking to my clinical team, like, I don't know, I need to get some blood work done. So they're like, and I've been with these people for a while now, over a decade. Um, and so I, uh, had a lot of blood work done and, and we were going to start comparing notes as to like how my blood work is today versus how it was then. And, uh, and it was really cool because there was quite gigantic shifts in the blood work. Um, cholesterol was going down. Um, triglycerides were actually going down. Testosterone was skyrocketing up. There was a phase about like two, two and a half years ago. My father, who's 15 years older than me, was got on TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, and, and he lost the grip of weight. So like a 
freaking, you know, diet addict, I was like, oh, I need to get on testosterone so I can lose weight. And uh, went in and somehow convinced my doctor. Luckily, I had a low enough testosterone, free testosterone level that she was able to prescribe it to me uh, without it being unethical. And so she, um, I was at like 300 and like, I don't know, 23. It was kind of low for my age, um, concerning, so to speak. So they were able to give me the testosterone shots. And so now on carnivore, though, my testosterone is coming in at 960. Meanwhile, after, during TRT, I was at like five, 600. And so then about six months into TRT, I was like, either, like, I either wanted to have sex or I wanted to fight you verbally, you know, like, and there was... (laughs) Like it was one of the two. It was like either we need to lay down and cement this celebration, or I want to argue with you. And you are absolutely wrong. I am right, and I need to go. You know, you rage in my car or something, or pound a wall. So I realized, okay, this isn't for me. And Brandon was like, "TC, you're becoming a different person." And I'm like, "Okay, I'm getting off this immediately." So about I don't know four to six months into TRT, I had my doctor wean me off and. We tested shortly thereafter. I dipped under the five to 600 mark barely. And I kind of slowly started regressing back down towards like the upper 400s. So I wasn't down at the 300 where I was before, but I was at the... So anyways, I'm on testosterone. The blood work comes back and I'm in the 900s. And my doctor's like, you're like a 15-year-old fucking boy going through puberty right now. Like what? Like, huh? And I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I mean, obviously I could tell, right? My libido was up, like, you know, mornings were different, you know, you get the point. So um, it was a whole shift in testosterone. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is, this is different. The doctors, the clinical team, therapeutic clinical team was looking at not only that, um, but they were also noticing that, um, that my, what I was reporting in their notes as far as the level of panic, anxiety, PTSD triggers were coming down significantly. It wasn't just like I was reporting one or two less panic attacks. I was very specific. I kept a log of the panic attack um, or the anxiety issue, or if I had a trigger and I was re-traumatized, I would always keep a log of that. Um, Being in recovery, it was pretty easy to do. And I wanted to have information. So we were kind of weighing, you know, the two together and um, meanwhile, I, I had just basically kind of let them know, I was very scared of letting the doctors know that I was on keto, but they started warming up to it because of just all the backlash that I got and, um, and, and how much they just absolutely positively did not believe in it and blah, 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 blah. And I just didn't need that, that voice in my head because it was working for the scale. Um, and, that's all I was bought in on at the time. I didn't want their voice in my head telling me that it wasn't going to be good for me because I was more concerned about the scale. So if they were going to try to mess with my scale, uh, I wasn't having it. So we would just would keep that part pretty quiet. Um, occasionally I would address it like, Hey, I'm on this keto thing. I'm like low carb. And I would really push the, you know, you know, I'm doing low sugars, you know, how sugar is really bad for you. You know, everyone's on sugar and, and sugar and addiction, you know, like drug addiction and sugar, like there's this huge correlation and this huge bridge. And, you know, like, so I'm doing better with that. So my addiction's better. Like I would just lead with all of that. Meanwhile, these numbers were just skyrocketing in crazy directions of course cholesterol glucose um all of the the um good vitamins and whatnot were were grazed were crazy well they weren't um they weren't deficient um only one time i've been deficient vitamin d um and it wasn't crazy deficient it just was i was deficient in vitamin d um i had higher levels of iron um and whatnot and so Long story short, I started opening, cracking open that door and expressing, okay, I'm actually on carnivore. And I've been on carnivore for six months now. And, uh, you know, in that time frame of six months, I probably had three, you know, deviations, like one for my relationship anniversary, and, you know, whatever, um, where I basically 
I didn't go crazy. Like I was talking about the Starbucks and all that other stuff. Like I had a salad and I had, um, uh, tiramisu and it was, we we're celebrating our anniversary. We've been together for a couple of years. We're at a fancy restaurant. We decided we made a conscious decision prior to going there. This is what we're doing. And yeah, so, sorry. um, yeah. And I allowed myself to live, you know, and it, and it felt good. I didn't feel restricted and whatnot, but anyways, I expressed to the doctor, Hey, this is, this is what's up. And, uh, this is where I'm at and I'm feeling really good about it. I'm still new to the whole experience. I'm learning, you know, from people like you on what reintroduction will look like at, at a, at a time. I, I saw you speaking to Ryan who lives up in Salt Lake. I think you're on his podcast or, or his YouTube channel, but, Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, was, you were talking about how you reintroduced and, and how very meticulous you were with it, how you didn't give up on how you, um, just because you had a, a weird, you know, feeling with something the first time you allowed some time to, to pass and then you attempted it again. And eventually, you know, slowly but surely your body was able to get used to it. So that kind of gave me hope. I wasn't really looking for, um, like, this to be the end all be all but i did find not only the mental clarity being able to navigate through all those people and all those situations and all those emotions without having my own personal come apart um i started noting more and addressing more self-care you know the importance of taking care of myself just it's super important in the field that i'm in anyways so i i love the fact that if you want to force me to go take a vacation i'm all about it you know what i mean so <laughs> like i'm ready to go on vacation. and um so but the mental health for me was a game changer um you know being 44 years old and not having to look at erectile dysfunction drugs and whatnot is a game changer um, literally, um, and you know, I'm not trying to go to the, the TMI portion, but literally being, um, in bed with the person that I love and being connected with them when I'm on this type of way of eating and just the passion and at 44 years old, not being destimulatized by all this external stuff, like actually being in the moment and being, um, and my body feeling as though as a male, like I'm, I'm 100% like, you know, firing off in all aspects of the way that my body functions supposed to be is miraculous. Like being in touch with that, that component of, of my testosterone boost has like been amazing. It's not like an ego thing. It's not like, but just, I'm actually more in love. I'm more passionate. I'm more, I'm more empathetic. I'm more present. Um, my, my mental, you know, clarity has, is more precise. Um, I'm busting out probably some of the best papers I've ever done in grad school. Like I'm killing it with the grades. I'm getting 94% and plus this. My last paper, I was in the top 2% of 113 students in my little session. I was in, she, 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 she made a special note to the, and I I was like, Oh my God. My partner is like, Batista, you're freaking killing it. Like a couple papers ago, she published me in Google scholar. Like, you know, and, and I'm telling you, Scott, like I was a homeless drug addict smoking crack out of a broken, like, like, you know, antenna from a car that somebody wrote, like, like, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Like (laughs) I was burning the most brain cells possible. And, um, and I, here I am writing papers on, um, schizo effective. And how to diagnose um, bipolar and how to, you know, delegate with somebody who's been molested and the approach that you want to have and the trust that you need to build. And, and I'm writing these papers, you know, um, with the attachment that I've been somebody who's gone through it. I think that that leads to a lot of the applause I'm getting academically is that they don't, I am like an albino elk in the scholarly world, like. Like I'm a rarity. You don't really hear about a lot of people that bounce back and then go into, um, you know, clinical work. There's we're very, very far and few between. But the ones of us that are out there, which are definitely, you know, out there, but it's a very small percentage, um, we're super effective because the connection. I don't know. The clients love it because they're like, shoot, if you can do it, I can do it. And um, 
they're like, you know, you just haven't learned this out of a book and you're trying to apply it to my life. You've actually lived it. So um, academically, I'm being rewarded for that too. So carnivore just has given me the most. Um, I did get scared in the beginning. You know, I was really scared. I was thinking, is this, you know, it started off with a month. It's, I think I'm now going into almost eight, eight months. I'm at the end of seven. I, uh, you know, I had no initial plan. It was going to be one month and then we're going to get right back to the carbs and whatever the cauliflower pizzas. And, <laughs> and, um, so, you know, and, and I haven't beard. I love the way that I feel. I love how simple it is. I love how easy it is. I love, um, I never knew. I was so disgusted by fat on a steak most of my life. It was the grossest thing, texture, everything. It bursting in your mouth. I was just like, when you got that gristle off of a steak and it would burst it, I was like, ah. And now I live for it. You know, it's it's night and day. Um, but mentally, the health aspect of it um, and what I'm seeing out in the community is epic it's just life-changing because to be a prisoner of your own mind to be a prisoner of your own mental capacity and to not know how to get out of there and to be at the end of the road and have dealt with countless therapeutic services and medicines and uh, leveling off of dosages and upping your dosage and, and side effects and not being able to sleep and weight gain and not feeling the emotions because you're on a mood stabilizer that doesn't allow you to cry, doesn't allow you to laugh, but you're not going to freak out because you know you won't have a manic phase because that's what we're aiming for. To have something uh, that's so nutrient dense give you that and to hear it out in the community that it's affecting people mentally is 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 it's it's epic. It's life changing. Um, it's, you know, and I'm hoping that it just continues to roll and roll and roll. So, of course, today, it's got my view of, um, you know, in the beginning, everyone's like, heal, 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 you're going to gain, da, da, da. I was like, oh, my God, I just didn't want to hear it anymore. I was like, I, mean, I am here for the poundage and for the scale, and I don't know what you guys are talking about, but now I'm here for it, and uh, <laughs> now, I, now I actually preach to it. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's kind of like where I'm at. That's great. Yeah. I think weight loss can be the hook that gets a lot of people in. And I think that's great. Um, I'm all for that if it gets people interested, but as you've said, there's so many other benefits and life changing aspects of this. Um, yeah. Batista, this has been fantastic. Um, love hearing from you. I think people are going to love this episode just as much as the first one. Um, please Thank remind folks that. where they can find more about you. And uh, I'll, of course, have links to all your stuff in the show notes. Um, so I'm on um, Instagram at the, uh, sorry, at Joyful Carnivore, all one word. Yep. Um, they can also find me, my personal page, which is at Batista. B A T T I S T A underscore Locatelli L O C A T E L L I, um, and I'm also on Facebook Batista Locatelli if they want to add me as a friend or direct message me. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you so much for providing the space and and I will just comment really fast, Scott. Your listeners are without a shadow of a doubt the most amazing people I've ever met. They have reached out. I have passed <laughs> on messages to you. They give me paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of feedback. People are listening to this podcast on airplanes. They are traveling to spaces, going hiking, listening. You know, like they're listening to when they get off of work. Like, I mean, I, it's phenomenal. Like the the amount of uh, beautiful praise, love, support, kindness that I've gotten back from your listeners. So thank you for giving me an opportunity and a, and a platform and a space to be able to share my story. Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh I won't take any credit for it. It's all, it's all in the listeners and guests like you who, who keep them coming back. So thank you for that. Yeah. Well, you know, come on, take a little credit. <laughs> you, you're amazing. Okay. You're pretty Thanks. amazing. You have a lot of love out there. All anyway. right. Well, thank you so much, Batista. Have a great day. Definitely, Scott. You too. Bye. Bye. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore cast on Patreon by becoming a patron. You'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. 
There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore or research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.